Welcome to the New Monastics Podcast, where we'll be discussing all aspects of the contemplative life and interspirituality in the context of modernity. On each episode, we will choose a topic to explore with one of today's leading teachers or thinkers. The New Monastics Podcast is a project of Caris Foundation for New Monasticism and Interspirituality, which is dedicated to the emergence of a newly conceived contemplative life of embodied spirituality and sacred activism. Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of the New Monastics Podcast. I'm Natanel, co-founder of Caris Foundation for New Monasticism and Interspirituality, and I'll be one of your hosts today. And I'm Daniel, and I'll be another one of the hosts. Today, we have my close friend and co-founder in the Caris Foundation, Rory McEntee. Rory is a leading voice in both the new monastic and interspiritual movements, who has lectured at both Kane and Drew Universities. Rory also co-authored the New Monasticism, an interspiritual manifesto for contemplative living with Adam Bucko, the third founding member of the Caris Foundation. And we wanted to dive a bit into that book today. But since this podcast is being produced by the Caris Foundation, I wanted to first ask you both, what is the Caris Foundation? I don't know the answer to that question in a way. (laughs) Um, I know where we started. We started out as the foundation for new monasticism. And and where we really began was with a friendship between the three of us, uh, Rory, Adam, and I. And we knew that there was something happening between us as friends, a dialogue that was emerging, that was rich and themed. Uh, around a common fascination with monastic structures and and how they operate in our daily lives and not necessarily in a cloistered environment. And we were all interspiritually oriented. And so we came together in a dialogue until at a certain point, um, uh, I believe it was Adam who first really said it, that we needed to create a foundation as, as a housing and a vehicle for what was emerging. But what was emerging, we, did, we didn't have a name for exactly. And so we did form the foundation. And the reason we've called it charis at this point, which is a word that means grace in Greek, is because the longer we've worked, the more we've learned to trust what emerges. Uh, as grace and to follow that inspiration, to follow uh, the kind of rich organic thing that happens out of our dialogues, the dialogues that have been at the center of our work and and so on. And so it's hard to say a lot more than that. We could, you know, get programmatic and mention all our initiatives and stuff. But if you want to be truthful, that's what happened, I think. You know, I don't know, Rory, is it similar for you? Yeah, I think that captures it very well. We've gotten to where we've gotten uh, by being open to what emerges and to where we feel the call of the spirit or grace. And uh, we tend to collaborate as family, as see ourselves as family, um, and almost operate as a kind of, you know, family run and oriented uh, foundation, nonprofit. And just a couple for posterity's sake, I would say um, there was a kind of new monastic man- uh, manifesto that Adam Bucko and I had written, and I had gone to see Llewellyn Bon Lee, a well-known spirit Sufi teacher, uh, and he had suggested to me uh, the idea of creating an on-the-ground organization uh, was the original, I think, inspiration uh, for something like a foundation. And then just to say that it was Adam Natanel and I uh, went up to Snowmass, uh, Colorado, to St. Benedict's Monastery, uh, where Father Thomas Keating uh, resided, and held a week-long dialogue there uh, with Father Thomas, as well as with Beverly Lanzetta, uh, who had been working on what she called new monasticism for 30 years, perhaps, at that time, 
Uh, and we had found each other through this kind of manifesto that had gone around and recognized um, shared resonances. And over that week-long period at St. Benedict's, um, I think is when Adam first suggested maybe starting the foundation together uh, with the three of us. And so that's kind of where it was born from. Thank you, guys. Um, before we get into the book and the manifesto and diving a little bit deeper into new monasticism and specifically interspiritual new monasticism, as there are other new monastic movements, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. But just before launching into that, given that this is our first episode, I just wanted to give a little space for us to share with our listeners what we're hoping to do with this podcast and this space and the inspiration behind it. And so I'll say a blurb and then feel free to chime in, y'all. Um, I think, you know, many, many inspirations, but one core thing is that we recognize that the ways in which people are consuming media is changing in these days and that many younger people are maybe less likely to go to a spiritual bookstore and be exposed to a spiritual book like Autobiography of a Yogi that might turn them on to a spiritual path. And we're really wanting to meet people where they're at. And we think that podcasts and other kinds of media that is becoming popular is a great way to reach people and have these kinds of conversations. And as we'll get into, Natanal and Rory both do a lot of work in an emerging spiritual paradigm and exploring what that is, what that means, possibilities for it in dialogue with traditional teachers and mentors, as well as a whole range of things. And there's such a rich arena for conversation and dialogue, which a lot of the work of the Caris Foundation is based on. And so we really wanted to create a space for a diverse dialogue. And I think we're hoping to both address specific topics within religion and spirituality, as well as do some interviews with people. And we really want to touch a whole spectrum of teachers and voices, both very traditional and non-traditional, and really continue having this dialogue for how we can get it together, as mine and Natanil's teacher used to say, the only way to get it together is together. So we're hoping to do that. Do you guys have anything to add to that? I like the idea of, of talking about new media, but it, interestingly, it sends me in a like a totally different direction because you know the, the the idea of the podcast and people listening to podcasts almost addictively now. There, there's something to that that is not about it being modern; it's about it being old. Like we're listening. You know, it's so primary for us. Uh, it's about conversation. But in this case, you know, being able to listen in on conversations. And so in a way, it's like the oldest technology. It's about communication. And, you know, it's bringing us back to something very basic. You know, listening to voices, trying to have a connection to authentic wisdom as it's being spoken. Not that, the, you know, there's anything particularly wise in us. But the, the idea of, you know, just like, you know, why are the Upanishads called the Upanishads? Because it meant leaning close, you know, and listening to the wisdom, the stuff that isn't in the books necessarily, the stuff that you talk about and you work out together. And the only thing that's truly new here is uh, we're allowed to, you know, put an ear to the wall to listen in, you know, to these conversations that are being had and they're accessible. And so I love that connection between the ancient and the modern. And that's what really makes something exciting here for me. We're sitting around the Zoom campfire here. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that characterization of it also as the return to the old, you know, and of course, even before the written word, humanity subsisted through oral traditions. And those, some of those oral traditions continue down to this day, especially in indigenous traditions and really brings about a different, um, a different atmosphere in which to learn. So I, I really love that. And I think, um, you know, another reason for the podcast, um, 
is just a lot of the work um, that Karis has done up till now, uh, or a big, big part of it, I should say, has been uh, some kind of invitation-only dialogues. Um, and in that time, we've just had the honor of being able to meet some really amazing people and to really nurture some deep friendships and intimacy among just extraordinary human beings. And have often thought how nice it would be to be something like a fly on a wall in these places uh, with these people. And so the podcasts are one way of us helping to give back some of the experiences that we've had that we've found to be very life-giving and have helped us a lot on our path by just kind of creating this a network for other people to be able to be a fly on the wall and absorb some of the wisdom of a vast diversity of voices who are very seriously trying to live out, you know, lives um, that are transformative and spiritually deep and really dedicated to changing our cultures and civilizations to reflect what's deepest in our hearts. And we're hopeful that, that this can be one vehicle for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think as we're, as we're touching on it already, I'd like if you could just speak a little bit to this dynamic of old and new, but being both simultaneously and how Karis Foundation and interspiritual new monasticism situates itself in relation to the current spiritual religious landscape like globally in terms of all the many traditional religions that exist and traditional monastic structures that exist, as well as all the kind of burgeoning things that have been happening in terms of new religious movements, especially in America. We have an incredible proliferation of new religious movements in the 20th and 21st century. So if we could just explain a little bit, because I think that's one of the things that as somebody who's a little bit on the outside, I'm a student of Natanals. That's all I that's all I am. And uh, so I'm just kind of, I am, I am that fly on the wall in a, in a lot of ways for some of these conversations. And I think it can be valuable because I think your orientation towards the past and the future, if you will, or the old and the new is particular. And I think I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. I, I really like your characterization, Daniel, is between the old and the new. And is that as a kind of avenue to talk a little bit about some of the work we see Karis doing? And so the old doesn't mean old. I mean, human beings throughout all of our existence, as far as we can tell, have had people who have discovered depths uh, to the human consciousness, to our human ways of knowing and being in the world and practices that help deepen that as well as an underlying reality that has been described as loving, compassionate, full of wisdom that unifies all of us in a way that also differentiates with the greatest sensitivity and leaves our uniqueness intact. So human beings have always, in all cultures and traditions, had people who undergone, went, they did these journeys and then passed on what they were learning with others or formed communities of inquiry um, around how to deepen and mature in a spiritual sense. So that part, I don't think is old or new. It's just part of who we are as human beings. I think the new part is part of the cultural conditions today in which those searches um, are undertaken in various ways by various people. And part of what Natanal and I both um, feel very blessed to have had is kind of some relationships, traditional relationships with mentors and teachers who were established in religious traditions, grew up in a different time period, a different culture, uh, were very much forerunners of what we see today in that they also began to reach out to others from different traditions, walking different ways, but who also were trying to cultivate a deep level of spiritual maturity and transformation. Uh, and as a result of those mentorships, we have some sense of how the kind of many of the traditional ways operate and work. We understand the languages, uh, we understand the patterns of mentorship, not completely, of course, but we have some good experience with them. 
At the same time, we have not grown up in those same cultural conditions. So for instance, I had close teachers who were Catholic monks like Brother Wayne Teasdale and Thomas Keating. Um, I've had extensive exposure to Tibetan Buddhism and consider the Dalai Lama teacher and also had a Hindu Advaitic teacher. Um, and in addition to that, I've had experiences with other religious traditions as well. So my kind of upbringing <laughs> has been interspiritual from the beginning. And Natanal has a similar story. So in one sense, we kind of have had access to traditional ways um, that have been passed along that are really efficacious for a spiritual journey. And we've also grown up in slightly different cultural conditions that overlap more with the conditions that many people today are searching within. So today we have these traditions are completely thrown together, right? Especially here in the United States, the diversity is everywhere, racial, cultural, ethnic, religious. And so as people begin this kind of ancient human practice of transformation and spiritual search and spiritual practice, uh, they do it in a context where we're all living together and amongst great diversity. And so I think part of the work of Kara's foundation is situating itself in that kind of in-between state between the old and the new, not in the sense of an old and a new spiritual journey, but in the sense of different cultural contexts is all and providing some connecting links between those um, so that we can you know, make use of the best of what our human family has brought forward in these most important issues. Yeah, I, I really agree um, that it's it's really good to talk about this old versus new uh, language and, and be really clear. You know, like Rory said, old doesn't mean old. And what we mean by that is that like, Old and new, or if we talk about new monasticism, or if we talk about interspirituality as some sort of new thing, it, it sounds like a critique. Like the old is outmoded and the new, you know, is replacing it. And that's not what we're really talking about at all. The old isn't old. It's, we're talking about a relationship between what is emergent and what is already there. And so the old that is not old is our past, is our history, is, uh, as my teacher would have put it, the, the magisteria that is our inheritance. All the lore and traditions and teachings and all that we are as humanity and have been. And the new is just the growing edge of that. Uh, where we're going, what we don't know. And so, you know, the old is not old. It's, it's our foundation. And, and then, like, what is growing on the edge of that? And I, I like, too, that, you know, Rory brought up our teachers. And that's an interesting discussion about old and new. Because some of our teachers were bridge figures. Uh, as Rory put it, you know, they, were, they grew up in a cultural context that was different than our own. Not just growing up in a different time, but in enclaves of culture. You know, one of my teachers, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, you know, was born in pre-Holocaust Europe and then made it through the Holocaust, he was trained in Hasidism very formally. It's a kind of context that I will never know. But I got to know him. He grew up in it, and then he was one of those pioneers like Father Thomas Keating, who was also growing up in a context like that, holding a tradition and then being on the growing edge of that and reaching out to other traditions and learning from them. And it's going to be an interesting thing because people like Rory and I got to know very closely those bridge figures who had those cultural contexts. And the people that will come next that will be connected to us, they're like connecting to the person who stood at the end of the bridge. If those were the bridge figures and we're the people that met them at the edge of the bridge then there's already going to be a buffer between these deeply embedded cultural contexts and these new kind of highly hyphenated, uh, highly complex structures that are coming after where the culture is not as definite and defined and, you know, 
I don't want to say insular in a negative, but where the insularity really cooked something very rich as a product of that culture. Now it really, we really are entering the melting pot period of, of spirituality. Yeah, as you were sharing, I was remembering the tunnel that you you pub you publish books through Albion Andalus books, and that at the opening page of every book, there's this quote from I believe a man named Rav Cook, and it says, "The old shall be renewed, and the new shall be made holy." And I think that I imagine it's a, it's printed at the front of every one of your books because it is kind of core to exactly what we're talking about now and how to simultaneously not reject the past or the wisdom of the past and embrace that while also not rejecting what's emerging now and today's values like there are many values right that we hold today that are in some ways challenging our religious structures whether that's gender and sexual orientation or other questions and you know we think it's really important to have safe spaces and to do the thing where it's about it's about spirit it's about the path it's about deepening into something where these cultural factors in terms of what's a certain culture approved of isn't necessarily relevant or should it be relevant to people's path today and so you guys both spoke about mentors and teachers and as we're talking about this i just want to highlight the you know, new monasticism and interspiritual new monasticism, interspirituality, all the combinations. It's while it is something that is emerging, and you know, uh, Rory, you wrote the book with Adam, I believe it was published in 2014, correct? The manifesto on new monasticism, 2015, I think, yes, 2015. So, you know, qu- quite new, and yet there is almost a a lineage of people who have been talking about this and adding ideas into the cauldron, if you will. And in, in the book, Rory, you and Adam name some of those people. And so in whatever direction you want to take it, I'm curious about two things. One is the kind of lineage ancestors, if you will, of interspirituality and interspiritual new monasticism, as well as a little bit more about your own teachers, because I think it's important to highlight this dynamic that there's always been guides, there's always been communities in terms of deepening into the spirit or into a spiritual life or really just accessing the fullness of human potential. And that's always been happening. And that's a lot of the question is like, as communities are evolving and transforming and taking on new diverse forms, how do we provide that spiritual guidance, spiritual community in a way that is really aligned with, with individuals um, that really works is efficacious. I don't know if that made any sense, but <laughs> no, it does. it does, it does. Yes. Um, so my first uh, spiritual teacher was Brother Wayne Teasdale, who coined this word inner spiritual. And so Brother Wayne, in his 1999 book, The Mystic Heart, uh, first use of the word inner spiritual. I remember reading it at the time as a draft and thinking this was a funny little word <laughs> and not being that connected to it at the time and not really recognizing, um, I think, how ahead of his time in some ways Brother Wayne was. Uh, for me, it seems so obvious this is already what I was doing under his tutelage. You know, why do you have to use this new name and have this new concept? I don't think what I had recognized is how Uh, subversive the concept itself could be for some people. And so Brother Wayne was a Catholic monk uh, in the Christian sannyasi movement. So he actually wore the orange robe of a Hindu sannyasin, but he had been initiated by B. Griffiths at Shantivanam, which was an ashram in India. And B. Griffiths was also a Kamaldolis monk, originally from Britain, who had moved to India uh, and started an ashram and wanted to live the Hindu lifestyle, but also at the same time began imbibing um, spiritual practices of Hinduism and a kind of desire to 
have some of the deepest experiences of ultimate reality or of God that were found in the Hindu traditions, at least some Hindu traditions. Uh, a contemporary of his was also Abhishek Dananda, uh, Henry, L- Henry LaSalle, uh, who was from French and also a Catholic priest who moved to India and then had a long running um, experiment between Hinduism, Advaitic Hinduism, and Christianity and his Catholicism, and left behind um, a wonderful array of books about his kind of deep struggle as he actually experienced these tensions in the depths of himself and in the depths of reality. So I kind of had an inner spiritual upbringing from the beginning. And Brother Wayne's spiritual father, in addition to B. Griffiths, was Father Thomas Keating. So I sort of inherited Thomas Keating as a teacher. And Thomas Keating had uh, been a founder and probably the biggest um, teacher of Centering Prayer, which is a Christian meditation uh, movement. Uh, He developed a silent meditation technique within uh, the Catholic faith tradition, as well as a wonderful psychological framework uh, using modern psychology for how the technique works. And Thomas had, um, Father Thomas, had also started something called the Snow Mass Conference, uh, which was an interreligious conference that invited teachers or advanced practitioners who were established in different religious traditions up to St. Benedict's to his monastery for the most part, where they would meet for five days uh, each year in a kind of intimate retreat setting. And Brother Wayne was very inspired by this work, and I think it really inspired his use of his his naming the term inner spiritual, which he really used to name a kind of sharing of our own personal experiences of the depths of reality. In particular, the ultimate experiences as found in various religious traditions were now coming together and being shared Um, in a personal, intimate way among people, and that this formed a real basis, a new cultural context uh, for the spiritual journey, which he called inner spiritual. And in that vein, uh, Brother Wayne also was good friends with the Dalai Lama uh, and would go see him and consider the Dalai Lama a close teacher of his. And I, I got to accompany Brother Wayne on his last trip there But so he also had this kind of Hindu, Christian, Buddhist um, fecundity in his spiritual life, even though he identified with and very much was a Catholic monk. And so you see there the kind of context of the old and the new, uh, along with the just kind of changing cultural conditions that are sometimes about globalization and everything coming together. But in Brother Wayne's context, it's much more about intimacy and friendship and a willing to learn across what might look like differences, but aren't necessarily. And so how do we take these into account and then live them out in our lives and then give birth to the gifts that come from that, I think is what he was really trying to get at with his use of the term inner spiritual. And I, Natanel might want to add some stuff here too, before we or go off into new monasticism or something like that. No, I, I think that that was great. Um, yeah, there's a there's a just a number of key figures that um, really set us up for this dialogue, and it, and it was by their own bravery and and um, vulnerability, because you know in the time in which you know these forerunners that Rory's talking about were doing this work, um, there would have been a high level of criticism for doing it. Uh, for pursuing such an exploration. And they're doing it from the heart, not just from intellectual curiosity. I mean, there's there's that element. There is lots of, you know, intellectual curiosity about what's going on on the other side of the fence. But that's not really what was motivating people like Brother Wayne or the people that came before him, like especially Abhishek Dananda or Bede Griffiths. They were inspired. They were, you know, uh, Benedictine and Kamaldoli's uh, monks in India, meeting people like Ramana Maharshi, and and going, oh my God, something's happening there that is amazing, and and feeling the vibe of that, 
and knowing that they have to understand what is available there. And that leads to a great tension inside, you know, is the truth in my tradition? Is the truth outside of my tradition? Is the truth between traditions? And they really en engage those questions. Uh, I don't think they get enough credit today for the bravery of those acts. Because the, the feedback, let's call it, <laughs> would have been pretty intense for them. Uh, the criticism that they would have gotten. And so um, we're standing on, you know, uh, you know, the phrase is used a lot, but we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Like the perspective that we can have today is because these people went before us and, and have lifted us up to see a vision of our totality. But it came from intimate places, like Rory's mentioning, like for Brother Wayne, it's like it's about intimacy, not about like uh, a romantic vision of our unity that that's nice that's good but it came from the experience of our unity and intimacy mm. so you know the, these uh, there are a lot of beautiful hearts mentioned in there yeah and i just to follow on that point so beautifully said it's you know it may give rise to a kind of romantic vision of religious unity and that can be helpful and it can also sometimes cover things up but it's really it's the concrete human relationships that the inner spiritual is born in, you know, real relationships among real human beings who are sitting down together um, and really talking about what's most important in their lives, in the depths of their souls, what their experiences have been, and what does that mean for all of us? I also think that's where the work of Karis is uh, in much of the work that, in how we try to proceed in our work. That's the idea behind a kind of family run you know, um, nonprofit, as well as the dialogues being at the heart of our work. It's real people in real relationships speaking intimately to these issues. And then the other thing, the Karis Foundation has worked really hard to bring in, in addition to the religious diversity um, that Father Thomas and Brother Wayne were working with, um, is also speaking to our contemporary socio-political issues in bringing in groups that are gender diverse, ethnically and racially diverse, and allowing these issues to be able to come in to that kind of atmosphere, to an atmosphere of intimacy and contemplative depth that is about what's deepest in us and what our potentials are, and then how what are the practices, what are the ways of thinking about the issues that confront us today from this place? And what comes out of that might be different than what we get from academic theories or from um, frameworks we put on the world through our minds and then try to address these issues through those. As important as those are, I think the contemplative depths um, that human beings are capable of also have a lot to offer the pressing issues that we all face today. I'm curious, we've been using the word inner spiritual, you know, a fair amount. I like to just get a little bit deeper into what that means. So I think the simplest way to ask it is just who is inner spiritual? And luckily, Rory, you already answered, so I won't make you answer in a performative way in the sense that in the book, you guys note three possibilities of being inner spiritual, being deeply embedded in one tradition and connecting to other traditions from your root tradition, having two or more co-equal religious belongings where one is not necessarily primary, and a non-traditional path that you and Adam identify as your own, as you called it, an inner spiritual path of not necessarily being squarely rooted in any one particular tradition, but also being connected to a variety of traditions or teachers and or teachers and you know even trying to name that third possibility I get a little tongue-tied it's so hard to say exactly what that is what that means so if you could just go a little bit into that of who, who is inner spiritual and what are the possibilities what are examples you for instance you said uh Brother, Brother Wayne was a Christian sannyasi. So this is already a kind of inner spiritual possibility. But again, that's 
from a place of being rooted in one tradition. And as you spoke to for your own path, I think many spiritual seekers today either didn't grow up with a strong religious tradition, or if they did, they've become alienated from it and their spiritual search doesn't necessarily feel resonant with their religious upbringing. And it raises so many questions and and just trying to prepare for the podcast, do a little research and stuff. It's so fascinating for me because there are infinitely more questions than answers. There's not a lot of concrete things to really rest upon. And in, in that way, I think I have a sense of almost the anxiety that this space can create because there's not a solid ground. There's not solid footing. There isn't just somebody to say, this is the truth. Do this, do that. The onus is being really put onto individuals and individual communities to say, what's valuable? What works? What like what is the real and how do we achieve it in a real way? I think I said real like 10 times because that's what it's all about, right? It's all about the real and it's all about, as you've spoken to, applying something that is ancient today, which is humans have always been in a deep connection to their own hearts, the universe, God, spirit, however you want to put it. And I think that's undeniable. I mean, I think the way you characterized it, Daniel, is is very much aligned. Um, You know, I was keeping with kind of the metaphor that Natanel brought up before of the growing edge, um, which, by the way, inspired me to find a poem from one of our, someone we would claim lineage to, I think, and has been uh, an important figure for both of us is Howard Thurman. Um, And maybe I can read that at the end of our podcast. But this idea of the growing edge where, you know, it it really is in a liminal space. There is an instability to it. And part of the the joy and the challenge and I think um, the potential for that, for being on the growing edge or for what we might call inner spiritual And the instability underneath it is it does put the onus back on the individual and individual communities. And of course, that's where spiritual maturity is always going to come from. You know, the onus is always on, as the Buddha said, work out your own enlightenment. Be diligent about it. Test my words. Test what I'm doing. You know, trust in it. You can trust in it because you can see the transformation in me. But it has to be working in your own life. And I just think, you know, the switch to an inner spiritual perspective is that that's really what this is all about. It's not about being this or being that or being Christian or being Buddhist or being Hindu. It's about reaching our deeper potentials that are grounded in love and compassion and wisdom and connect us with everyone else and with all of life. And what works for someone, that is to be supported by everyone no matter what your path is or your tradition. And so I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I just want to, I'm not sure where it heads, but I am becoming convinced that we are being asked in this world by younger generations, by everything we're seeing, for contemplatives or those who are um, advanced practitioners who have devoted themselves to spiritual maturity to come together and to form communities not just amongst those that they share practices or frameworks or religions with, but to come together in their diversity and to form these diverse communities. We're being asked as a world and as a country to come together in all of our diversity. If those of us who have been doing deep practice, building the inner resources to actually be able to handle coming into contact with others who we differ from, on things of greatest importance in our life, if we can't come together and form these diverse communities, how do we ever expect everyone else to? And I think that's a big challenge that's arising from this younger generations who are going about perhaps their search for a deeper life and a life of meaning in a way that's not um, 
bounded within traditional religions. What they want to see is diverse communities that can flourish. And if contemplatives can't do it, I am not sure what hope there is for us to do it as a human family. And so I think that's a big challenge of the inner spiritual as well. Yeah, I think, you know, as Rory was talking, I was uh, thinking about uh, interspirituality as the context in which we do our spirituality or we do our religion. And and really, that's that's kind of what it's the word is suggesting. If these contemplatives are going to come together and prove that that diversity uh, can be accommodated, what allows for that is an interspiritual perspective. Interspirituality is a framework in which we can operate together and, and not have any triumphalist attitudes like my, uh, my belief about this has to be superior over yours. And well, we're right about, you know, these end time, you know, prophecy, you know, that's, that's the stuff that's kept us divided. So in, in some ways, interspirituality is a perspective, uh, a context in which we can work out our relationships. You know, it's a dialogue space. Uh, where we meet as human beings and appreciate the diversity of our experience in dialogue. And going back to the categories, I remember, you know, when Rory and Adam were writing the book, we were all dialoguing. This, this is the very period in which we were of our early part of our friendship. And so we were dialoguing about those categories. And at this point, we've thought a lot about them, the categories of the interspiritual and some aspect of interspirituality is the search for articulation. I mean, that's just an aspect of it, is that we're trying to articulate the things that are on the growing edge. And so it's imperfect and it's reaching. But all we have to do really is look around and look at the experience of some of those people that define themselves as interspiritual. And their experiences are different, and yet they're still interspiritual. And we validate that. And so, you know, you mentioned a few of them. One might be a person that is firmly rooted in Christianity, say. Uh, they, they may even be a, a priest and completely devoted to their tradition, operating from that framework, loving that framework, in a loving relationship with Christ, you know. And yet, there may be an overarching context in which they see themselves as the truth is not contained exclusively within Christianity for them, even though that's a loving context of spiritual development for them. Truth is not owned by it, and so they see themselves in an interspiritual, con interspiritual context, which in some ways is, is liberating for them because then they can learn from the diversity of the people around them, and that diversity can inform and enrich their own Christianity. You know, uh, my own teacher is, you know, somewhat, you know, impishly called that the spiritual peeping Tom, <laughs> you know, that, you know, like to look across the fence and be inspired by what was happening over there. And so that's, that person could also say, I'm interspiritual while being a, a devoted Christian. And then looking around at the experience of people, we also find people that are, you know, I've used the language, you know, and, you know, I've extended the language of my teacher around hyphenated spirituality, that there are some people that have dual connections between more than one tradition, and they're trying to work out the relationship of holding two traditions. It's hard enough to hold one. And so it's... It, it's not actually, you know, that desirable sometimes to try to hold two. I talked about the tensions for an Abhishek Dananda or a Bede Griffiths who are doing that, who see themselves as hyphenated and inspired by two and enriched by it. But the interspirituality is in the inter, in the hyphen between them. And there's a lot getting worked out in that hyphen. And in some ways, the human being in that context is the hyphen, meaning they're the, pl the meeting place of two traditions, perhaps, say Hinduism and Christianity in that example, or in my own, 
Judaism and Islam or two esoteric traditions from Judaism and Islam. And, and I become the meeting place of traditions which are abstract. You know, they have teachings and everything, but they're abstract. They're not individuals. I'm an individual and I've got to work out this whole thing. And, and so from that perspective, that person is interspiritual. And then, you know, you mentioned the hardest to articulate. And, you know, and Rory's very comfortable saying, I'm interspiritual. It's not about hyphenated spirituality for me exactly. It's not about coming from one tradition and seeing myself in this context. I'm interspiritual. And I think what a person who says that is saying, I define myself in the liminality. I'm not defining myself as in the tension between, say, Judaism and Islam. It's just I'm comfortable in the liminality, which is in, in, in a weird way of saying, like, I'm comfortable being myself as the meeting place of all this information and all these inputs. And no one of those examples is more interspiritual than the other. It's just that the, maybe the last one, that's their only naming point. Now, I might say, you know, so I'm Sufi Hasidic or that other person, I'm Christian in an interspiritual context. Uh, the naming point for the latter, you know, that last group is, I'm in this liminality. I'm interspiritual. That's my tradition. So it's a, it's a fascinating discussion, and, and no one of those is more right than the other. And, you know, and where I started was, it's a little in, in our, inarticulate. You know, we would like really um, comfortably fixed names for all of these things. But it's, it's a searching discussion. It really is. Hmm. And it could also be, you know, I think caught up with a sense of vocation as well and calling. You know, in personality and background and history, but also, you know, where do you feel called for your path and where do you feel called to serve others? I mean, so there's ways I could articulate my path as a kind of, you know, mostly Christian, Tibetan Buddhist, you know, but the fundamental heartbeat is really a guidance of the Holy Spirit, which is in the book that we wrote. But I have these other elements that are very strong and I can switch into them. And I'm much more comfortable calling myself inner spiritual. It's more descriptive, I think. And Natano put it so well as in the liminality. And something so important to mention as well, related to this growing edge, is that someone may change. It, you know, being in a certain place doesn't mean you're always on this growing edge, whether you're in a tradition or not. And a perfect example, Adam Bucko and I wrote that book together. Uh, as Natano mentioned, it came very much out of dialogue. The original manifesto came after we had met and talked basically daily for two years and realized there was some kind of shared resonance here that we wanted to give a name to. But since we wrote that book, Adam has gone on and joined a seminary uh, and become an Episcopal priest and is now an Episcopal priest in Long Island, uh, serving a community. And all of this is fully supported uh, by me and by others in our inner spiritual community, if you want to call it that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it's what's going to like serve the person and what's going to serve others and all of life. That's it. So I think that's the kind of um, perspective or just change, nuance in perspective uh, that an inner spiritual brings to the spiritual journey, which of course is happened, uh, you know, throughout all of human history. I mean, Christianity is a straight-up blend of the revelation of Jesus and Greek philosophy. We call it philosophy, but really it's religion. It's a spiritual path, um, it, clearly a spiritual path. <laughs> uh, and so it's a blend of different religious traditions and Judaism, right? I mean, all religious traditions are syncretistic from the beginning, that's the thing, Roy. Just you know, just a minute ago, brought up um, one of the chief features of the way we talk about new monasticism. So to bring that subject back in, you know, what is new monasticism? One of the chief features of it for us is what Roy just mentioned—a sense of the call and vocation. 
So interspirituality is, is naming this context in which we want to live an attitude of being able to connect as contemplatives with one another. And it makes a place for a lot of people who don't feel they have a place, you know. Uh, they don't want to see one religion as, you know, primary. Uh, and they feel connections to multiple paths. Um, interspirituality makes a place for them. The new monasticism, as you know, as we define it, has something to do with a call to a deeper vocation and a sense of having a personal call toward that vocation. Tra traditional monasticism has been a has been a um, you know people that entered that life were entering into a very serious commitment, a long term commitment to a deeper relationship to a path that you know, required a kind of sacrifice. And, and while we're not talking about cloistered monasticism necessarily, we're still talking about the call toward, toward that, that deeper commitment when we talk about monasticism, that 24-hour-a-day spirituality. Where there's, there's no time off. You know, everything is in your spiritual path. That doesn't mean you're not going out for pizza, but it does mean that, that there's no there's no break from the contemplative process. It is all one life, and you're living it, and you're committed to it. Um, and there's no giving yourself a pass. So that sense of, of, of vocation and calling toward that serious a level of commitment is also an aspect of our dialogue. It doesn't have to be an aspect of a, a person's interest spirituality, but that's why we talk about both subjects, you know, new monasticism and interspirituality. And our new monasticism, you know, as you mentioned, is different in that there are new monasticisms that are movements out of Protestant Christianity. Ours is interspiritual. Yeah. And I then to just, that's such a great description. And, you know, we chose the word monastic specifically to connote exactly what Natanel just said, that kind of level of commitment. Um, and that's really how we use the word monastic, you know, and then the new part is just how do we work out that kind of commitment in new conditions that might look like living in the world and having relationships and friendships and having to figure out financial realities and all of this while embodying the same level of commitment. And that's the challenge. Yeah, I think maybe to paint a little bit more clear of a picture, it would be helpful just to read the new monastic vows that you presented uh, in the book. And so Correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, there's one of the aspects of a new monastic life as you and Adam are presenting it is a commitment to vows, but that there's not necessarily a specific set of vows that would be for an individual to discern what vows were aligned with them and their tradition. But you and Adam offer nine vows connected to nine qualities of spiritual maturity and so I'd like to just read those vows because I think they give a pretty good insight into the orientation. Again, the vows are all connected to aspects or qualities of a mature spirituality. And so I'll read the vow and then the quality that it correlates to. So the vows are, I vow to actualize and live according to my full moral and ethical capacity. So that's actual moral capacity. Two, I vow to live in solidarity with the cosmos and all living beings. Solidarity with all living beings. I vow to live in deep nonviolence. So a quality of deep nonviolence. I vow to live in humility and to remember the many teachers and guides who assisted me on my spiritual path. So that's a quality of humility. I vow to embrace a daily spiritual practice. So that's the quality of practice, committed practice. I vow to cultivate mature self-knowledge, quality of self-knowledge. Seven, I vow to live a life of simplicity. So simplicity of life. I vow to live a life of selfless service and compassionate action. 
I vow to be a prophetic voice as I work for justice, compassion, and world transformation. And that's connected to the quality of the prophetic voice. I think I missed the last one, but that was the quality of selfless service and compassionate action. So I wanted just to read those as I think they give some kind of a framework or a hint towards what that commitment might be like. And I'm wondering how you and Adam discern these nine vows and qualities and what you're hoping to emphasize with this presentation. One of the things that I would like you to speak to is that one of the things that is, I would say, de-emphasized compared to maybe other religious traditions is that there's not necessarily an element of enlightenment or self-realization or God-realization or a particular attainment that, Mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, you and Adam really emphasize the path as the goal that the goal is to be on the path of spiritual maturity. And that doesn't mean some kind of pinnacle of maturity or development, but having the resources and cultivating an orientation that allows us to travel and journey and explore in a real way that continues to help us become more and more vehicles of grace and spirit. And that that's different than you know, attaining a particular thing. And I'd like for you to speak to that because I think that that's one of the maybe valid critiques of the new age movement um, and some of what's happening in the current spiritual paradigm is that is very goal oriented um, and even sometimes quite superficial or shallow goals. And that that's really antithetical as far as I can tell to a lot of the traditional structures and maybe the traditional structures have something to teach us about how we can most efficaciously orient towards a religious or spiritual life. Sure. Um, I mean, that's an excellent question, Daniel. And I, and the way you framed it, I thought um, there, you really pulled out, I think a subtlety that is very much, Um, a conscious one that we put in there. And so thank you for asking it. I do think there are some issues with a kind of goal-oriented spirituality. And I think, you know, part of the issue there is a lot of um, spirituality in the United States, in the West, uh, a lot of new age spirituality uh, is a result of a lot of influx of religious traditions and religious diversity uh, into the West and into this country um, of a lot of Eastern spiritualities as well as indigenous spiritualities, but in a way where they weren't always um, grounded in the same kind of cultural settings and the same kind of practices that you may or may not see um, in the East, particularly an ethical basis. Like, so for instance, in Buddhism, you know, a lot of people practice Vajrayana or you want a particular experience or you want Bodhi. But in traditional Buddhism, you start with like some very serious ethical commitments and practices that form that foundation. So then whatever kind of experiences you have already get funneled into an embodied habitual life pattern in which they can be fruitful and efficacious. And if you remove that foundation or that container into which these energies will flow, then it becomes not necessarily enlightenment, but you might actually have amazing experiences. I think a lot of people that do um, new age stuff, and I'm not trying to denigrate it, but at times can have amazing experiences, but it's not necessarily getting funneled into a container or into one's embodied habitual life patterns in a way where they can be most fruitful And it's sometimes where they can actually be damaging, both to oneself, one's spiritual path, as well as to others, which the whole point of going on a spiritual path is not for one's personal enlightenment. It's not to, it's not (laughs) self-help. It's not to find peace. It's to be able to serve others in the best and most fruitful uh, way possible an encompassing way possible. And so if that's your goal, then a particular experience is only so helpful in as much as it serves that purpose. 
in as much as it helps you to become um, of service to others. And so that was very conscious, I think, as we went through it. And that's not to say that we are not in favor of particular experiences or of experiences that arise on the spiritual journey, which can be very important and very healing um, and very opening (laughs) to our worldview, to our consciousness. Uh, Those are very important. But what is more important than the experiences is the container within which they're brought. And so we, we do spend a lot of time trying to point out and build good containers so that when one does have experiences, these are then channeled in ways that really help to mature one's spirituality, which should always have these qualities in it. Um, so I think it is very much less about a particular experience is about a process of deepening and maturation. And just to say, I mean, there's a Christian element here too, and this might be a real fruitful tension even uh, between different religious traditions, which can be a growing edge. But there is a sense, at least from uh, my teacher, Thomas Keating, as well as other places in the Christian contemplative path, that it's actually, even though there are experiences and stages, union with God, unity consciousness, that the entire um, example of the Christian contemplative path is of a person who gave that up. Jesus gave up being God, humbled himself to take on this humanity and this suffering and its weaknesses. And he's not in an ecstatic state of equanimity uh, in his passion. You know, in, in the penultimate moment you see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's crying tears of blood. He's asking for this to be taken from me. But in the end, he's willing to do what will serve others in the greatest way possible. And so there's an element of the Christian contemplative path that was very deeply, I think, uh, embedded in both of us that is also coming through there in some sense. That the path really is about service and not about um, a particular experience, which is not to say that's not true in other traditions as well. It's just defined a bit. I mean, in Buddhism or in Tibetan Buddhism, I'll try to be more specific to what I know. You try to become a bodhisattva, you know, in order to serve others. And you even put off Buddhahood until the moment ripens where it will serve others in the greatest way possible. In fact, you're willing to give it up for eternity if you can serve others in the best way without that. And the whole reason for going on a path to become a Buddha is to serve others in the best way possible. So I think it's important as a kind of corrective to exactly what you spoke to is some of the the ways people perceive their spiritual journey today in the kind of atmosphere, cultural context in in which they take place. Well, I just wanted to jump in there and take maybe a slightly different direction because I think what you're speaking to is actually something that you bring out in the book, but is, is something deep that I'd like for you just to give us a taste of in terms of your thinking around, which is this idea of the spiritual path being for others, but also for the world itself. It seems inspired by some of Pierre de Hard de Chardin's work that the earth, the universe, God is seeking its own actualization. It's reaching to the fullest potential. And that as spiritual practitioners, we're playing a role in that divine unfolding and, as I understand it, uh, interpenetration of matter and spirit and the divinization of the planet, as Chardin would say. Well, you know, it's something about perspective, you know. We're suggesting a corrective on perspective, you know, in terms of the way spirituality is approached today. You know, we've been talking about this, this spirituality for me, is very dominant right now. Spirituality for me, for my inner peace, you know, as if it's a commodity. And that's part of the disease. Like, 
our spirituality has just entered commodity culture. You know, so how can it not then participate in the disease it's meant to correct? You know, people are looking to spirituality to correct the disease that they've caught from commodity culture or capitalism, however you want to name it. And yet, the way we approach it is in the exact same way as we approach all these other things, as if it's something I can buy, something I can put on for a moment, you know, something I can taste for me. And so we started as Foundation for New Monasticism, but then we changed our name to Karis Foundation for new monasticism and interspirituality. But changing to Karis was very intentional. As I mentioned, as we, we, as we witness the action of grace in our work and realize that's the center of it, we realized in some ways that's what was missing. I think we wrote it, uh, we wrote it somewhere. Uh, here it is. Um, Karis is that aspect of action and grace so often forgotten in the spirituality of effort. You know, you know like we think we're going to acquire, attain, you know, by our efforting, we're going to get something. And, and that's the, the kind of the enlightenment perspective. I'm going to go get enlightenment. Not that that's wrong entirely, but it, the emphasis becomes problematic. So in the spirituality of effort, where we see ourselves as the protagonist in the spiritual journey, seeking a relationship with the sacred, which in reality, as Abram Joshua Heschel put it, was actually in search of us. You know, so he said God is in search of the human. The human thinks it's in search of God, but God is actually in search of the human. And so we miss something in this spirituality of, you know, this commodity spirituality where I'm going to grab that, this spirituality of effort where I'm doing it. I'm at the center of it. It's for me. And what we miss is the context. You know, I do want to go back and, and say that the nine vows as presented in the book were actually framed by Reverend Diane Burke based on what Brother Wayne called a, something like nine aspects of a global spirituality. So he, he takes a good like 30 pages of his mystic heart to outline these nine things, these qualities of a universal spirituality. And then, you know, our colleague, Diane Burke, she boiled those down into kind of nine vows um, very nicely. So we just want to credit her for that. But it is, you, you, you caught on to a subtlety that they don't really suggest, you know, a trying to, it's not like I vow to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. They don't really say that. Uh, they're more like, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do this. They're more proximate deliverables, you know, <laughs> than enlightenment or transformation. But by trying to do them, there is transformation. Um, uh, we've also, uh, for our own purposes, uh, now, you know, rewritten these and, and added one to the beginning, which is, you know, more along the lines of, I vow to pursue a deeper understanding of life and reality, both the knowledge and the mystery at the center of all being. So for, for us, that focuses the activity of being a voice for justice living in solidarity with life and creation, because there's this call, this, this call from, you know, the, this, the mystery at the center of all being to pursue some uh, understanding of life and reality. It's like there's something we don't understand here. Our discontents are around this lack of proper understanding of what reality is or a misperception of reality. And so we brought that to the beginning of the vow. So now there are 10 and we've rewritten them, rewritten them a little bit so that it's not quite the same as, as Diane's version anymore, but it's still based in Brother Wayne's universal uh, aspects of spirituality. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Just before we, before we close here, I wanted to also name the kind of structure that you and Adam outline in the book in terms of practice. We've been talking about this, what embodied spirituality, monasticism in the world. And I don't know if we've said this so far, I just want to clarify that 
by new monasticism and the way that you guys are talking about it, it does allow for having a family, working in the world, having relationships of various kinds. Nothing necessarily is excluded in terms of things of everyday life. And so there becomes this real question of how does one enact a life committed to spirituality, especially in the world when I think we can recognize that a lot of the contexts in which we find ourselves are not supportive of living a spiritual or mindful or contemplative life oftentimes are antithetical to it. We have notifications buzzing in the background constantly ready to distract us away from the simplicity of paying attention to our breath or paying attention to the leaves rustling and the things that have been nourishing for humans for so long. And that in a way, it seems like that pushes us to have to have a structure if we're going to survive the fast-paced times of modernity, that to not get completely uprooted from a contemplative lifestyle that we need to have structures and practices. And so you guys recommend a basic structure of practice that could be followed by any of the kind of inner spiritual typologies that we've named. And so I just wanted to offer that as just a glimpse, because I hope uh, for the interested listeners, they will they will go back and actually read the book. Again, that is The New Monasticism, an Inner Spiritual Manifesto for Contemplative Living by Rory McEnty and Adam Bucko. So with everything we're talking about, there's a lot more to go into. And so, yeah, the practices that you guys offer are, are a structure for a spiritual life is daily practice. So some kind of a daily practice weekly, monthly, or yearly practices. So one example that would be like observing the Sabbath once a week. Uh, sacred activism, the spiritual practice of vocation. Formal study. I took that, and I believe you say it explicitly, to mean formal study with a religious or spiritual teacher. Shadow work. So the psychological work of processing repressed or unhelpful psychological material, spiritual direction, spiritual friendship and community, and a commitment of vows. If you have anything just to say about that, Rory, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about about the structure in general or clarify any of those particularities, but I know that we're probably coming to a close here. And so just wanted to make sure that we got that in, in terms of what does it actually look like put into practice? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Daniel, for bringing those up and for reading them. I think it's, it's really important because that's kind of, that's the heart of the matter, right? How do we put this into practice? And there's a little bit of a paradox here just to point out too, you know, how we're talking about relativizing in some sense attainment a particular experience, right? But at the same time, relying on grace, as Natano talked about, and at the same time, having to very seriously look at our lives and look at how we spend our time and make changes uh, in order to live out a kind of maturing process in our spiritual path. So the commitment and the need to actually do practices is not in any way mitigated (laughs) by... Uh, the coextensive need to not hold on to some attainment or some particular experience that one might have or that one might think one might have in the future. So it's a paradox that always puts us between a rock and a hard place, uh, which is where the spiritual growth and the spiritual journey really takes place, in my experience. Um, And so all of the, it is very true that we do not live in a culture or society that is going to support at this time these kinds of lifestyles. At the same time, all of these obstacles are stepping stones. They're, you know, what Buddhists call precious jewels. They're the place of practice. If we didn't have them in our way, then our practice would not be as good. And so getting over all the obstacles in your life to actually putting these practices into account, to being able to sit every day 
for some kind of silent meditation. That means you're getting up an hour earlier, going to bed an hour earlier, then that's what it means. Um, finding time to do some reading, finding time for spiritual direction, and the entire search that goes on with that. One might go on for years trying to find a spiritual director and not find one, but not giving up is the primary practice. And failing to get these practices in your life over and over and over again without giving up getting them into your life is the practice. So just to say that the practices are very important, but the process one goes through to get them in your life is equally, if not more important than the practice itself. And one should expect to fail over and over for weeks and months and years and decades in doing it. But one is only losing out and failing if one gives up. If one gives up the idea that I need to do daily practice every day, then then you fail, right? But keeping that commitment, keeping that yearning and not letting that die, tending to that flame, that's what's going to get you there. So you just try over and over and over again. Right. As Pema Shodron says, fail, fail again, fail better. Yeah. Yeah. And Cornell West and many people. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm hoping to elucidate a, no, not elucidate, wrong word, elicit a story from Natanal to close us out and then your your poem, Rory. So I would like a a new monastic story from Natanal and this this poem that you'd like to share, (laughs) Rory. All right, put me on the spot. A new monastic story. What do you mean? Um, okay, I have a suggestion. Okay. Can you tell the story about Reb Zalman going to see Thomas Merton and not wanting to ring the bell? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, my teacher, Reb Zalman, you know, Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, you know, came out of the the Hasidic tradition of Judaism. And so for many people that, that may not mean much, but you may have seen traditional Jews, you know, the men with long beards and even side curls and black hats and black suits. And and it's a, it's a mystical sector within Judaism. And Reb Zalman came up in that path and was firmly entrenched in the Jewish tradition, but had questions outside of the tradition and a great curiosity and desire to explore. And um, around 1960, a student of his from the University of Manitoba had uh, made the trek to Kentucky to meet Thomas Merton. And Thomas Merton was then becoming famous as as a kind of a public spiritual figure, having written a best-selling autobiography or memoir. And and so through that connection, Reb Zalman became connected to him and finally made the trek himself to the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. And a traditional Jew with his, uh, his, his, his deep um, commitment to a certain kind of path of spiritual development and values He approached this monastery with trepidation. And you can see him in his black suit and black hat and, you know, carrying a suitcase to stay in a monastery. And uh, he once told me uh, privately, like, he had a great fear that he might die in the monastery. God forbid something should happen to him. He'd have a heart attack or something and be this Hasidic Jew who died in a monastery. What would people think? What would they say? You know, would they say that he had gone there to convert? He was very scared of such a possibility. (laughs) And so, and, you know, and what would his teachers say? And then, you know, there's a fraught history between Christianity and Judaism and history of persecution. And all of that's present as he walks up to the monastery, walks up the drive. And there's a kind of gatehouse, a little gatehouse out out front where you know a person could sit inside it and it's a monastery and and it has rhythms and not everybody's available all the time 
And so they have a bell. If you're a guest coming to the monastery, a visitor, you should ring the bell. So he's gotten off the bus at Bardstown. He's come to the monastery. He's walking up to the gatehouse. It's getting towards evening. He doesn't see anybody around. And he sees the big rope connected to the bell. And on the end of the rope is tied a very large crucifix. And he just looks at the crucifix and he looks at the rope and looks, the rope's attached to the bell and he looks up high and sees the bell and thinks, this is the only way to get in if I ring this bell. But in Judaism, like, it's a thing, like, you don't want to be, as it were, bowing to idols or looking as if you were serving some other religion. And to him, it looked like by taking hold of the cross, that he'd be taking hold of the cross, as they say in Christianity. <laughs> hold on to Jesus. And he was kind of terrified of that prospect, because this is early days. There's no interspirituality. And so he looks at it, thinks about it for a long time, and he decides to reach up high on the rope, high above the cross, and to pull on the rope from up there. And the bell rings. And then out from the shadows comes a monk. Turns out the monk was watching him the whole time from the gatehouse and walked up. And the monk just said this with a smile, an interesting solution to a problem of conscience. <laughs> and that too became a great interspiritual lesson, you know, of appreciation for the difficulties of navigating your own spiritual commitments as you engage in this intimate dialogue with other spiritual commitments. So thanks for reminding me of that story. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That's exactly why I wanted you to share. So Rory, will you will you close us out here with a with a poem? I just want to say Thank you to everybody for listening to this first episode of the New Monastics podcast. Oh, and I failed to mention, which I should plug in now, which is we'll be releasing an episode once a month, uh, the last Friday of every month, and that should be available wherever you normally listen to podcasts. So that's when you can expect us and hope you tune in in future episodes. And it's good to be here to all of you. Thank you so much, Rory. Thank you, Natano. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, for having us and for doing all this great work. Um, and I hope it really serves your own journey and uh, the journeys of others who uh, are inspired by it. And so this last poem uh, is from Howard Thurman, who's been, um, is my favorite scholar and, of course, has been a great teacher and just someone that I find brings together in a really life-giving way, so many of the issues that we are facing today. Um, and so the poem is inspired by Natanel's talk of the growing edge. Uh, and it can be found in the book uh, called For the Inward Journey, The Writings of Howard Thurman, uh, which was edited by his daughter, Anne Spencer Thurman, and I find to be um, the best uh, compilation of Thurman's writings out there. And so this is the growing edge. Look well to the growing edge. All around us, worlds are dying and new worlds are being born. All around us, life is dying and life is being born. The fruit ripens on the tree. The roots are silently at work in the darkness of the earth against a time when there shall be new lives, fresh blossoms, green fruit. Such is the growing edge. It is the extra breath from the exhausted lung. The one more thing to try when all else has failed. The upward reach of life when weariness closes in upon all endeavor. This is the basis of hope in moments of despair. The incentive to carry on when times are out of joint, when men and women have lost their reason. The source of confidence when worlds crash and dreams whiten into ash. The birth of the child. Life's most dramatic answer to death. This is the growing edge incarnate. Look well to the growing edge.
Amen. Amen, man. Cheers, everybody. Till next time. Till next time. Shout out to friend of the show, Tree Fort of Golden Turtle Sound for producing the intro and outro music and assisting with mixing and mastering. Be sure to check out his awesome music and hit up Golden Turtle Sound for any of your audio engineering needs.